continuance, but it is a continuance. We've been talking about the seven ups, right? Uh, living life fully engaged. Um, and Pastor Vincent gave us literally seven weeks worth of, of information about living our lives fully engaged. He gave us the seven ups. So we're going to recap those today. One of the parts of the assignment was he said, I want you to recap what I went through. Now, if you guys were here, because most of you were throughout those, that seven week stretch of time, it's a lot. He gave you a smidgen every week, but we never really, we used to do the review to renew. So part of the assignment today was just to kind of hit another review to renew. Not with the purpose of preaching the whole thing again, but with the purpose of going one step further. Because oftentimes we have, we, we get a sermon, we get a message, and we're like thinking like the what's, the what's next, right? So we have our seven ups, and then this morning we're gonna, I'm bringing you another up. I know that's not, that doesn't fit the theme, right? That's the eighth up, Elder Kyle. How can you give me the eighth up when the seven up, the, clearly the pop is seven up, and so they got a can, there's a big seven on it, you're messing up the, mo the mojo of the seven up. But we have our, our eighth up today, it's coming up. Today we're gonna be talking about what's coming up. See, we had our seven ups, we're living life fully engaged, and this is the what's, what do you expect once you start living your life fully engaged? What is coming up in your life? What's coming up in the life of Agape Church? What is going to begin at this time? See, eight in the Bible represents new beginnings. And so we had our seven ups, right? And now, of course, we all went home, did our homework, and now we're extremely mature, fully engaged Christians, right? We nailed it. First shot, he gave us a lesson, we nailed it. And so now we're ready for the new beginning. What's coming? I know that that's not true, trust me. Part of the sermon was God telling me how much I was missing the mark on the seven ups already. Like, you missed this part, and you missed this part. You didn't even pay, really pay attention to speak up when you watched it. I was like, man, got me. So I went back and watched it, I'm like, oh man, I definitely missed out the first up. So here we are. So we're going to dive into coming up. I'm gonna, Move forward, we're all going to stand to our feet. <clears throat> As we do here at Agape Church, we're going to do our Bible salute. Hold your Bibles high. We believe that the Word of God is the truth. So here we say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. There are many like it. There are many like it. But this one is mine. But this one is mine. I read from it. I read from it. I believe in it. I believe in it. I do what it tells me to do. I do what it tells me to do. Let's see. Let's eat, 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 All right, so if you'll turn with me in your books to Acts. We're going to Acts. That is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. I used to have a single little song when I was in like church school when I was little. Uh -oh. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts and Epistle to the Romans. <laughs> First and second Corinthians. I'm going to oh, mess it up if I keep going. Um, but Acts, we're going to Acts this morning, and we're going to be looking at Acts 2, verse 42. I'm ready from the New Living Translation. I forgot to put that on the slide. Slide guy, got to fire him. There's a typo on the next slide also. I noticed it later. Cut me deep. All right, anyway. So we're going to Acts 2, chapter 2, verse, two, uh, verse 42. <clears throat> and it reads this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. <clears throat> I'm going to go further, but I'm going to read one more time. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing meals and to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful and grateful this morning, God, for your word, because we know it is the truth this morning, God. I ask right now that you would just begin to have your way throughout this service, God, that you would take the word that is before us, God, and make it, make it useful to our lives, that you would continue to pour into me, that you would decrease, Kyle, that you would pour out of me, that anything that is said would come from you, God, that it be inspired by the Holy Spirit this morning, God, that you would have your way in this place, knowing that, it, that what we need to hear or what we need to read or what we need to see, God, that you can take care of that this morning, God. You can provide the lesson for us. You can provide the content for us. You can provide the correction for us this morning, God. That we won't take anything personally, God, because we know it's coming from you this morning, God. That as we read your word and the, and the, and the word convicts on our heart, God, that we know that it's really coming from you. It's a correction from you or it's a direction from you or it's help from you this morning, God. It's, it's really pushing us in the right direction, God. So we ask this morning that you would take this word 
And as we embark on our, on our new beginning, you would make it useful to our lives. That we would feel changed this morning, God. That Agape Church would leave this place changed this morning, God. That it would be going in the direction that you have willed over this morning, God. And that you would continue to do the things that you've already set in place for us. The victory is already there this morning, God. We're yeah. just asking you for the direction to get there. So this morning, God, we just ask you, we come to you prepared, ready to listen, ready to learn. And just asking for those continued blessings in our lives. We ask all these things in Jesus' matchless and mighty name. We say amen, amen, amen. 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 All right, you guys can have your seats in the presence of our life-changing God. High-five your neighbor on the way down and say, love like him. <clears throat> you can high-five two neighbors. It's all right. All right. So I think we worked through a little bit of those nerves here. Here we go. For those of you who don't know, I am a teacher by profession. If you, if you heard, I believe... Uh, who is it? Oh, the Matthews. Yeah, you offered up my services. That was great. Thanks. So you need some tutoring. There's some teachers. I hope it's not history because I can't do that one. I hope it's math. Uh, although Apostle Terry did say she can do accounting, so maybe she can do the math, right? All right, so this morning we're talking about what's coming up. All right, it's the next up in, our, in this little series. It's not really in the series, but it's the addition to, right? It's the footnote. Well, we'll add some little cornea to follow down the bottom book. All right, so we're talking about the Acts 2 church, and I'm reading to you from Acts 2. And really talking about the development of the church as um, as Peter, sorry, almost said the wrong apostle, as Peter had been preaching, and they really saw some growth in the church, and we're talking about what the church started to become. All right, so in chapter 2, uh, at verse 42, in my little book, it has nice little headers, it keeps me in order, it says, the believers form a community. And so then we start talking about this. So I'm going to read through some of this. I'm going to go further than 42. But the important thing was that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, communion, right, and to prayer. And so what we have is the believers starting to form a community, starting to form a church. And if we go on further into 43, it says, A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. <clears throat> then it says, They sold their property and possessions, and they shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. So as I was reading this, I'm like, this is where you start to miss me with it. Not because <laughs> there's something wrong with the Bible, but there's something wrong. It's, not, it's like this innate thing in me. When it said, like, they sold their property and their possessions. Does that, does that sound real, real echoey to anybody else? My voice? Or is it just my voice sounds like that? <laughs> Sorry, it's bothering me. All right, so they sold their property and possessions. And I started to think, I'm like, man, I'm, so, so in order to operate as a church, I have to sell all my possessions. And then, like, we, we, all, we all made it to the church. And I gave all my stuff away. And, like, the reality of the situation is, like, oh, I mean, if God called me to do that, then certainly that's what I should do. But we got to think about what the church was starting to form into and what we expect from the church and what do we expect from, a, from Agape Church. See, it's not so much only about everybody selling everything you have. It's about this idea that they started to come together. And they started to do things together. And that the church actually was meeting the needs of the people around them by taking what they have and meeting that need. So Agape Church, as we grow, as we picture, as we visualize what we're going to be, what our new beginning is going to be, we have to start thinking about what does it look, going, look like going forward? See, because as I look out right now, and you guys all have beautiful faces. I, I, I love being here, I love my church, I love looking out and I see you, but if I were to count on my fingers and toes, I might run out of, I might run out of people before I run out of fingers and toes. That means there's less than 20. I hope that I got that right. All right, but there's not less than 20. I don't know. Let's say there's 30 of us in here. There's 30 of us in here, and that is great because I would stand here and preach on assignment to one person. If it was me and my wife, she would she'd probably roll her eyes if I was preaching to her, just me and her. But I would do it if I had to, right, if that's what God's called me to do. And so thankful for everybody that's here. And so sometimes you're sitting out there, and you hear the message, and you're like, man, this is... I'm here. Why am I getting hit with all these pebbles? Like, why is, it, why is he coming down my aisle? Why are my toes getting stepped on and I'm here? The point being, what do we visualize for our church? So what can we do as one person? Well, I only have the stuff that I have, which ain't that much. I only got the money I got, which is not that much. 
I have the talents I have, which I think is a lot of talents, but it's not a lot of talents if you talk about the scheme of talents that exist in the world. I like, I like to think I can do everything a little bit. <laughs> not dance, I can't do that a little bit. Maybe not. All right, but <clears throat> the point being this, one person, what can one person do versus what can two people do versus how much could we all do if we're doing it together? So the church started to come together at this time and they put their stuff together and they were meeting the needs of the people in the area. And if we continue forward, we see that it says, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So at this point, the church is coming together as a community. <coughs> They're taking their time, their talents, their gifts, their money, their possessions. They're taking whatever it is they have and they're putting it together. They're working together to meet the needs of the people around them. And people are being saved. They're learning about Jesus, the apostles' teachings. They've dedicated themselves to following the apostles' teachings. They've dedicated themselves to following the word. And by following the word, people's lives are being changed. And it says, each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So the church is starting to form and make a community where people are being saved, and then those people that are being saved are joining the community, the church. And so then the church, by, by proxy, is growing, and now you have more people, which means we can reach more people, and so you have the body of Christ increasing. Yes. And it's crazy to think how much he can do if we just do our part, but we do our part as a whole. And so the world can be changed. The community can be changed. Your life individually can be changed just by working within the church as we come together. It's this thing about everybody working together in the same direction. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. So <clears throat> without jumping too far down the tracks, I do want to touch on our seven ups. So think of all that stuff I just said with regards to the stuff that was said seven weeks prior. All right, the seven ups. We had show up, we had link up, speak up, grow up, give up, live up, and sign up <clears throat> as our seven ups. The seven things that we want to master, the seven things we want to do in order to live life fully engaged. So as we go forward, we'll talk about each one a little bit. So when Pastor gave us this, he gave us um, a practical application for everything and a reflection. And I'm not going to point at anybody specifically, but I will speak for myself. I know that I was supposed to have taken that practical application and done what with it. I'm supposed to apply it to my life. I'm supposed to take that reflection question, read it, and then I'm supposed to answer. How does it go in my life? And so I did a bad job of that. So right now we're going to take a second. We're going to think. He said show up. He was talking about the power of presence being there. And one of the things he said, the practical application of show up was be on time. Be dependable. Come on purpose. So as we think about seven weeks, that was, oh, do you remember the date on that, Kim? The 20th, August 20th? We're in October. <clears throat> Maybe I might have been data. All right, so, so in the middle of August, he gave us this uh, August 20th. Huh? Thank you, Holy Spirit. My memory is, I got ADD if you guys don't know, so. Ooh, squirrel. All right, the point being that the power of presence, we're talking about showing up. So the question becomes, if you're looking at your practical application, what have you done in seven weeks' time to improve in this? If, if you're a person who is on time, like, maybe that part of it is not necessarily the issue you face. If you're not a person who's on time, how have you gotten better at that? Because we had seven weeks, he gave it to us, we, it's something that can immediately be put into practice, and we got to think, like, am I doing that thing? This is where the reflection comes in. Am I consistently present and engaged? Am I dependable? It's hard sometimes to answer those questions when you talk about stuff, because nobody wants to say, I'm not, I'm not dependable. Like, who wants to say that? Like, we have intentions of doing stuff, and we miss the mark. Like, man, I want to make sure I'm on time. It always seems, if you got kids, it definitely seems like, 13 things are going to go wrong when, you, when you're trying to get somewhere on time. My wife is notoriously good for being early, which helps me because we are just talking about this yesterday. We had to take a trip to D.C., <laughs> and it said it's going to take an hour and 48 minutes maybe. And she was like, yep, and we need to leave three hours early. And I'm like, what in the world? And it's often a conversation we have. She's like, well, there could be traffic. There could be this. There could be that. A bird could uh, head 
pooped a little bit on the windshield. We got to wash the whole car. I don't even know what it is, but she prepares for everything because she's a person who takes a lot of pride in being on time. <clears throat> I like to be on time because I grew up in a house where we weren't on time. <laughs> my nana just my nana just made a face because uh, <laughs> she is acutely aware of how often we showed up not on time for the thing. So, uh, and I, I always joke with my dad because he was never on time for anything. He's on time for his job now. I guess he just waited until he was older to be on time for stuff. But when it was my stuff, he was like, he was taking his time. Um, <laughs> they were like, your dad coming to get you? I'm like, I swear I called him. We joked because my brother, we said he took his, uh, everybody got wedding invitations. And my dad's had a half hour difference on it than everybody else's. <laughs> And then he showed up, he showed up on time, but he was a half hour early. He's like, why, where am I at? He was like, listen, we didn't think he was gonna make it. Um, so the point being, whatever your motivation for making the shift, the being on time, the showing up, being dependable, being ready, your motivation at this point would be because God is charging that to us. And you can go back and watch that thing if you're still struggling with the show up. How do I become dependable? As it says, am I consistently present and engaged? If you're not good at reflecting yourself, find an accountability partner. Someone who can be honest with you and your feelings won't be so hurt that you can't move on in life. Because here's the other thing. Sometimes we want an accountability partner, but we really want them to just tell us that we're doing a good job when we're not necessarily doing a good job. Yeah. You gotta have somebody you can talk to. If it's your spouse, sometimes it's hard coming from the spouse. I got it. Maybe it's a brother. Maybe it's a, a, a member of the church. My wife tells me I'm dropping the ball. It just, it hurts deep. I'm like, what do you mean I'm dropping the ball? I went to work just like you did. <laughs> She's, she, meanwhile, she did way more. She packed lunches. She got the kids, the kids clothes ready. I'm like, we work the same eight hour a day. We talking about I dropped the ball. No. All right, the point being, we got to show up, right? Yeah. Link up. You talked about the value of relationships, all right? The practical application, committed to developing healthy relationships. What does that mean? Dive back into that scripture. Drive back into that lesson. Go back to that thing. The reflection says, what ways have relationships grown in the last three months? We talked about trust, care, or respect. And so this is like, I'm up here talking, but this is really not new. This was, if that was uh, August 20th, the last one, that means this was August 27th. So what care or what intentional measures have you taken to deal with relationships? Whether it's relationships in your home, whether it's relationships in the church, whether it's a relationship at work. He gave a lot of talk about relationships versus real relationships. He said, I don't want a relationship. I want a real relationship. If we're talking about relationships with people, what have you done there? What if we're talking about our relationship with God? Have you developed a relationship with God? Have you done something different in the last five weeks? The crazy thing is, like I'm standing here telling, like whenever you have, whenever you're charged to give a word, it always hits you first. And I'm standing here asking you guys, what have you done in the last five weeks to increase, improve, or move your relationship with God forward? And I'm saying to you, it hit me first. It was hard to deal with. I'm in there in my room, little tears in my eyes, because I'm like, dang, I really haven't done what I needed to do with my relationship God in, with God in five weeks. I haven't prayed the way that I, I said I want to pray better, but I wasn't intentional about making sure I prayed better. See, it's a step of intentionality. Are you doing something on purpose? What's your plan for doing it? How are you going to make the shift in that situation? We talked about seven ups, and we had a moment to shift, but have you yet done the shift? See, we get wrapped up in the world, it's really easy. I got a job, Monday through Friday I work. I got kids, they got practices. I gotta catch a football game. Y'all like, hurry up and talk, because I gotta catch a football game today. Still is playing the Ravens. Should be an easy done for the Ravens. They gonna mess that up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Don't put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> take it back, take it back, take it back. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> exactly, all right? This is, this is what happens. I got, I'm got i at home. I'm supposed to be talking about my relationship with God. Here I am talking about football. Next thing you know, it's Sunday again, and I didn't take the steps that I needed to take before we got there. It's a, it was a perfect example right in the moment. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for taking that, turning into something good. All right. Speak up. We talked about this one. You talked about the influence of the power of, and he said your voice. I know in the, in the actual sermon, he said my voice. 
because you need to take ownership of this, the influence, influential power of your own voice. See, the reality is you can't control anybody else's voice. You can only control your own voice, which means you can only control what comes out of your mouth, nobody else's. And so we have to speak up, the practical application being committed to speaking life and not death into every situation. Are you speaking the word or are you speaking the world? I think once upon a time, my wife preached a message at Momentum. She said, get the L out of here, yeah. right? Yeah. <clears throat> Was that you? Yeah. It's okay, you can take it. I'm not going to put a mic in your hand. <laughs> there is <laughs> See, that's why I can't preach to her one-on-one. She'll be listening. <laughs> All right, so we got to speak up the power of your voice, thinking about how you speak to people, what words are you saying, what tone are you using, <clears throat> when are you speaking. Because speak up means that you're saying the word at the right time, with the right in the right way, with some love, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're yelling loudly so everybody can hear you. See, because we yell loudly when we're upset. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure everybody hears us when we're mad. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure everybody hears us when we're displeased. But if it comes time to shout out praises for God, magically, we got real quiet. Sure, sure. We, it's the alligator arms of speaking, mm -hmm. right? You, raise your hands if you like this. I have students. My students, I'm like, put your hand up high uh, if you have a bus you can ride in the morning. The kids be like this. I'm like, that's high? Now, I said, put your hand up high if you want a Jolly Rancher. Blam. Mm -hmm. They put two hands up all the way to the ceiling, jump out the seat. All right, the same thing with our voice when it comes time to speak up about God. See, if only people only ever hear you yelling loudly or speaking loudly and it's always negative, it's time to flip that thing. Yes. See, because the negative should be the quiet. When you're upset, that's when you should say less. And when you're speaking the blessings of God, that's when you should be saying it louder. And then what are you actually speaking? So it said, how often have you given feedback or shared an idea in the last three months? One of the things Pastor was pushing us to do was to open our mouths and share not just the word of God, but being bold and confident in the things you're doing. If you're at work and you're in a meeting and you have an opinion, not being timid, but confident to share because God created you. You are special in the way that God created you. He gave you ideas. He gave you a sound mind. He gave you the ability to work. And then he's saying to you, child, like. If I tell you to speak up, you should do that. We shouldn't be scared to speak up as Christians about God, about other things. It's crazy to think because sometimes when you say, like, oftentimes I'm at work and people will say, like, I don't, I don't talk to everybody about everything. I don't talk to everybody, but not about everything. Um, I don't tell my my business to everybody because not everybody in the world needs to know my business. Uh, but I'll have a small conversation with anybody. But it's funny sometimes people will ask me my opinion about something, and I'm usually a jokester. Like, I'm telling jokes. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make a laugh. I'm the class clown. I'm in the back of the classroom. I make, say the funny thing. All the kids laugh. Teachers mad at me. That was my style. I still do that as an adult. My boss asks questions. I just make the joke. Okay. But there's sometimes when somebody asks me something, I'll say something where I'm being serious, and then they're like, I didn't even realize you could be that serious. And that thing you said made me think. See, we all have that ability. We just have to tap into it. Your personality is great. Be who you are. If you're a jokester, be a jokester. But don't be afraid to speak up for God. <clears throat> Grow up. This one was hard. This one's always hard. Right? The goal for maturing relationally, emotionally, so spiritually, socially. The practical application. Being committed to being made into a faithful, fruitful disciple. And then the reflection, what are some growth activities that you are currently working on right now? I thought this one was important because growth is important. Um, again, I, I reflect back to what I do. I'm a teacher and this growth mindset that you want to take wherever you are and move forward. So the thing about growth is it can happen for anybody. You could be an extremely mature individual, but there's still room for growth. Somebody said, one of my coaches growing up used to say, the biggest room in the world is room for improvement. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter when we say we want to mature, we want to grow. It doesn't always mean that you're immature. It doesn't always mean that you haven't been growing. It just means that you need to continue to grow and move forward, that you have to mature in some areas. It says, what are some growth activities that you're currently working on? Unless you are perfect, unless you're Jesus, which you're not, <laughs> which I'm not, 
that, that sounded like really accusatorily to all of you, which none of us are, then that means there's some area that we need to grow. And that means it doesn't matter if it's five years of marriage, I guess, then a pop-up, you've been 60 some years of marriage, 60 on the dot, okay, 60 years. Of, like, there's always some area somewhere that we could grow in if it's anger. Like, I just get angry so quickly. What are you doing to intentionally grow in that area? See, we think that, like, by avoiding areas that will, like, I didn't get mad. I didn't lose my temper in two weeks. But I avoided any situation that would have caused me to lose my temper. And then the moment that that same situation pops up, your temper pops up. And so sometimes avoiding the test doesn't mean that you've actually passed the test. It just means you avoided the test. If you want growth in an area, you have to be willing to be tested in that area. You can't pray for patience and then not expect a situation that requires patience. What you were really praying was for God to remove that thing that makes you impatient. But God wants growth. And there's a time. Like, God will bind something if it's necessary. But remember, he doesn't give us more than we can handle. So if he's giving it to you, that just means you got you can handle it with the strength of God. You might have to pray. It means you might have to be quiet. It means in the moment when your anger wants to flare up, you just zip it. You go to your Bible. You, you read the words. You get in your prayer closet. You pray those words. If you can't think of the prayer, you read the word. You let that wash over you, and then you grow right there. See, grow up was the one that really hit me the hardest because it doesn't even, I'm always, I still act like a child sometimes. And it says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. When I became an adult, I put away my childish things. You have to put away your childish things. You can't act the same as you were before. Now that you know, Pastor, I said the boogers on your finger. Yeah. It always sounds childish to me, but like, whatever, here we go. The boogers on your finger. What you going to do with it? Right? It's a weird saying. <laughs> I mean, it's a great saying, Pastor. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick it up a little bit here because I want to get to coming up. Give up the joy of generosity. Pastor talked about surrendering, right? The commitment to honoring God with your life. Set aside your personal proclivity for self-preservation. We all want what's best for ourselves. We all want what we want. We all think it should be our way. We all are selfish by nature. Selfish, that's the flesh. That's the thing that we, the sin that came across when Adam and Eve bit the apple, right? It poured in, now we have selfishness. And so our natural tendency to be selfish, I want mine, give me mine, give me, give me, give me. What about me? I got four kids. If one of those kids gets one Dorito, just one Dorito could fall off from heaven just one Dorito. Not even a good Dorito. What's a bad flavor? Just, just a regular, just a nacho cheese Dorito. No, just regular. And they'd be like, if one got one, the rest of them, where's mine at? I didn't get the Dorito. The whole world has ended over one Dorito. And it's like, it's this selfish nature because that's what we want. We make jokes when it's little kids, but the craziest thing is, like, as adults, we do the same thing. We just think because it's something more important, it's something more expensive, that it's somehow more important. I saw the car they got. Why didn't I get my car? Why didn't I get the promotion that they got? Why didn't I? Why didn't I? Why didn't I? God, you must hate me. You don't like me. Are you even real? Because I didn't get the things that I decided meant more. But we got to give up that self, that selfishness. We got to give it up for God's will because he'll bless you. There's something there for you. You just got to do it. It says, when people consider you generous, rate your consistency in meeting your obligations. Like, that was his reflection question. Would people consider you to be generous? Are you giving? And see, the thing about giving is it's hard. Sometimes you give and you don't get back. And that wears on you. Right? And that doesn't mean you should always be pouring everything you have into something that's not fruitful. Because I would never say that. God doesn't tell us to pour into things that are fruitless. But are you giving into things that are going to be fruitful? Are you helping? When God tells you to give, do you give without question because he told you to? He says, so $10 to that person, and we tighten that fist and we get angry. He says, give that person that, that conversation, that 10-minute conversation that they needed. Give your time. I don't have time for that guy. But that 10-minute conversation might be the thing that changes somebody's life. Maybe they're going through depression. Maybe they just, maybe they're not even certain. Maybe they were, I, I, I'm going to go home. I'm going to just probably say the complete wrong thing when I get home to my spouse because I'm upset. And they needed 10 minutes of your time. And God put you in position to speak life into a situation. So now you had to give up 
so that you can speak of and see that's being fully engaged using the seven ups all right live up the strength of integrity practical application committed to represent christ by maintaining good reputation at home work church etc see this talks about integrity which is your character it's the thing that you consistently do when nobody's looking Character is not about doing it for anybody else. It's crazy because, like, we forget that God's looking. When you, when you, I don't know, when you hide in in your car, when you, I don't know where people hide to do the, the if you, when you hide in the back alley, whatever it is you're doing that you shouldn't be doing, right? When you steal that money or you, it's not a big deal. It's just a dollar, right? But a dollar becomes two dollars, and two dollars becomes four dollars. Uh -huh. I hate to be like it's a slippery slope, but it is. but when you are comfortable consistently sinning, not that you won't sin, but that you're comfortable sinning, then you end up not living up to what God has called you to do. You end up tarnishing your reputation. You end up hurting yourself, and you end up <clears throat> discrediting your ability to do what God has called you to do. So we need to live up to it. And then sign up. This is our last one. We talked about it last week, so. Won't hold you guys your feet too hard to the fire. That's one we just learned about it last week. It said, sign up. The impact of serving. Practical application. Committed to serve your family, the church family, and community by being involved in ministry activities. And the reflection. Have you served or worked above what is expected in the last three months? Have you served? How have you served? See, the world's got us, like, upside down. They think that because... It teaches us that to serve is somehow low. Yeah. So I don't know, you go to McDonald's. I shouldn't even use McDonald's because they listen. I'm not gonna use McDonald's. <laughs> I haven't worked through that issue yet, so I'm gonna be quiet about McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> you can't complain about Chick Fil A. They get your order on time and they smile on your face. They give you the extra. They give you the exact number of sauces you asked for. Um, but. But have you ever been somewhere and you see, like I've seen people, or maybe it's even something you've done, and you're maybe not proud of it, I hope you're not proud of it, but where we speak just poorly to a serve, to somebody who's in the service industry, could be a waiter or a waitress, and you just, because I guess they're, they're a waiter and they're serving you, you feel as though, and I'm paying money, I should just be outright disrespectful to you. And so that's thinking about people who are getting paid to serve. Now imagine how people get treated when you just serve. And what you say, it's often looked at as low. Yes. But it's crazy because all Jesus did while he walked the earth was serve. And I hate to say it, like sometimes it's Christians in the, in the, you see them, they drive off with their, not hopefully not a love like him bumper sticker. But they drive off with their little fish bumper sticker on the thing. After they just gave somebody the poor toll booth worker the business over, over 75 cent toll. Like it's crazy to me, right? Because people are in service, we often think low of service, but we need to think the opposite, right? Serving is not low. It actually takes a lot of willpower to serve somebody and to lower yourself to that thing. I'm going to, I'm sorry, when Jesus washed the, the disciples' feet, you're like, man, I would have to really lower myself to wash feet. I've seen some feet before that I just don't want to go there. And this feet ain't like, first we washed feet, this feet, they were walking out in the sand. I had to tape a kid's ankle one time at wrestling. Man, I saw you could see the cartoon vapors coming off the foot when he took the sock <laughs> off. I was like, <laughs> the toenails was looking disrespectful. I was like, what am I gonna do? As a child, somebody's kid, I can't even say nothing bad about it. I'm just like, my God, I need. Whew, all right, well, I'm gonna serve in this capacity. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even all that saved yet, so I was still working on stuff back then. <laughs> Uh, but the point being, like sometimes you gotta serve, and sometimes you gotta you, know, you gotta wash a, a dirty foot. It's okay. <laughs> Jesus did it. We can do it. All right. Exactly. So now we're gonna talk about coming up. Finally, we got through our redo to review. We got through our recap of the things. It's really important though that we go back and reflect about our seven ups. Yeah. I know we're note takers here, but we what we really need to be is the people that take those notes back out. We open that book back up and we revisit. And when I was preparing for this sermon, it's one of the things I had to do was go back and review. And I was reviewing at a level that I typically would not have reviewed. I might listen to them again and I look at my notes and I catch them, but I, I haven't been doing it the way I need to do it. And so we really have to, as a church, go back and look at that because it's gonna be the thing that propels us into the next. We have to be, so the thing that he said was fully engaged. 
living life fully engaged, right? So our practical application for this one, I try to keep it the same thing. Prepare for the expectations and struggles of living life fully engaged. When you guys decide to grasp onto those seven ups, when we decide to grasp onto the seven ups and start living life fully engaged, we get all the way locked in. There's gonna be expectations that come. There's gonna be struggles that come. And so those things, we have to prepare for it. Pastor always says, if you, if, you, if you are ready, if you stay ready, you ain't gotta get ready. I think that's what it is, right? So we have to prepare. See, because we think fully engaged, is, uh, I say we think, at times you think, man, I got saved. I gave my life to Christ. It should, it should go easy, right? This is the, the, mo- the life-changing moment. Christ is in my heart. I feel it. I got the butterflies. When I walk out of this door, the evil things are going to move out of the way. Nobody's going to come test me because I got my smile on. I'm a Christian. Move out the way. Move out the way. You're not going to mess with me. I'm a Christian. God's got my back. He's going to protect me. And we think that that means nothing's coming our way. But in fact, it's actually the opposite. See, because the devil's less concerned with you when you was living a sin. Right. Oh, it almost got me, Bernicia. <laughs> we, we joked about me tripping on this rug. <laughs> I said, if I fall down, just, just pray over me and just go home. Just, <laughs> <laughs> don't even pick me up. Just let me lay there. I'll just go lay there. Just pray over me. Y'all pack the stuff up. Just take it home. <laughs> go watch football, all right? <laughs> all right. And then I want you to think about reflection. What causes you to disengage from life plans? from Christ, whatever it is. Because we're talking about being fully engaged. I just told you that you're gonna have to prepare for struggles. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to deal with the weight of expectations. And you have to reflect and identify what are the things that cause me to disengage. Because if I require to be fully engaged, but I'm quick to disengage, then I'm gonna miss the mark. I can't really prepare for it if I don't know what it is. So if it's, I get overwhelmed by a lot of tasks. I told you I got ADD, I'm distractible. So if that causes me to disengage, well, how can I fix that if I don't identify that? You gotta pay attention. If it's um, just time and preparedness, I need more time to, to, to be prepared for something. And you know that the lack of time will cause you to be disengaged. Identifying that, will help you plan for that. And if you can plan for that, then you can prepare for that. And if you're prepared for it, then it allows you to remain engaged. So we just gotta start being more intentional. Fully engaged <clears throat> means to be completely occupied or to give your complete attention to something. Completely occupied by, like if I'm fully engaged, if I'm fully engaged in my home life, then I'm, then I'm there for it. I'm not disengaged. I'm not distracted by anything else. When you're having a conversation with your wife, are you fully engaged? <clears throat> I'm probably not. She started talking to me in the middle of a commercial that I really was interested in for absolutely no reason. <laughs> I, have to, I have to pause the TV. I have to like, all right, hold on, hold on. This sounds important. Boom. All right. Whew. Go ahead. I'm engaged now. I wasn't engaged before. You caught me slipping. I was not paying attention. So I need to pay attention, right? Being fully engaged. Um, so I want you to think about this engagement thing, this aspect of being engaged. So these, these dangers of being partially engaged. <clears throat> when, I was, when I was planning for this, one of the things that brought to my mind was like a transmission. I don't know, does anybody know anything about cars? Okay, your, your motor runs, right, motor runs. Transmission is the thing that takes the motor power and puts it to the wheels, right? So picture some gears running in a car. It's not super important that you understand all the depth of it, but that there's teeth that go to these gears and they gotta run together. And so when your transmission is fully engaged, that's where you pull the little stick and it goes into drive, you've now engaged your transmission. So think about being fully engaged versus being disengaged. Because the motor runs, turn the car on, the motor's running. The car's not going anywhere. Why? Because we haven't yet engaged. So some of us, we got our motor on. We're working really hard, but we're not fully engaged in what we need. Now, anybody drive stick, manual, or I know have the capabilities of driving stick? I know it's, I'm dating myself, I guess. We're getting to that point where people don't. You ever, you ever get stuck halfway in between a gear? What, what does it do? Oh, it makes a grinding noise, right? You, if you got stuck halfway in between the gears, like, 
the, the young people, Aaron's looking at me like, what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> Just push the gas in the car, it goes, man. <laughs> vroom, vroom, right? The Tesla don't even make noise, do a name just like, no. <laughs> sound like a Jetsu car. <laughs> 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 All right, so we got the we got the we got the engagement of the motors, but like the gears, when you used to shift, it'd be first gear to second gear, and when you're learning, you don't quite hit the thing right, and it goes, it's a terrible noise, right? It's awful. I couldn't even, and it, it makes your heart jump. The car stalls. If your dad's teaching you how to do it. He's yelling at you. You know, boy, you gonna drop my transmission? I'm like, Dad, this truck is like 90 years old. It's all right. <laughs> I had to crank it to get it started. That's an old person joke. <laughs> all right, but. Being engaged means fully coming together, ready to go. So when you engage that transmission, let's say you put it in drive, well, what happens? Just the act of being fully engaged causes the car to go forward. So without even pushing the gas, the moment you fully engage and you take your foot off the brake, well, before you can push the gas, your car starts to creep forward. So getting fully engaged in your life, getting fully engaged in the church, just the enactment of engaging starts to move you in the right direction right. you start to move forward now how fast you move forward has to deal with how fast you push the gas right. right but when we push the gas now we're going forward faster faster if you're Aaron you slammed it all the way to the ground because you're showing off for your friends <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably a really safe driver it's probably Jaden to be driving faster <laughs> both, probably. both both <laughs> all right there's also the other aspect of engagement. So what you engage with makes a difference. So we put it in drive and we're going forward, right? But what if I put it in reverse and I take my foot off the gas? What do we do then? We creep backwards, right? And how fast you drive backwards depends on how much you push on the gas. So what you are engaged with can make a difference for what direction you're going. Are you engaged with the word? Are you engaged with church? Because you can creep forward, you can move forward, you can sprint forward, you can drive forward, fast and furious going forward, but at the same time, if you engage with the world and you get look back in that rearview mirror to the things that you used to do, just as easily you can be fully engaged going the wrong direction. Now I'm picturing a 90s rap video driving backwards like, mm, that's a, that a biggie video. <laughs> Him and Puff, Puff Daddy, Diddy Pop, right? <laughs> right? Driving backwards. So we've got to get fully engaged. We've got to get engaged in the right thing. Knowing that once we engage, we'll move forward. And then here's the thing. Now we're in a car. I'm going to use the same analogy since, since the Holy Spirit gave it to me. We're creeping forward. We've got to think about what's coming up ahead. Uh -huh. What's coming up ahead? We've engaged. We signed up. We got rolling. And we've got to think about what's coming ahead of us. See, we're driving down the road in our car, and things are going to be happening. When you drive, there's not a road, unless you're in Delaware, that's just straight. In Delaware, all the roads are straight. It's one road. That's why I say all the roads. There's one road in the straight. <laughs> all right? <laughs> but you drive for about 10 minutes, and then you're out of Delaware, and so it's not being straight anymore, right? So everything is straight. Sorry, in Delaware, everything's straight. That's not what I'm saying. Nothing is really straight, though, in your life. When you're driving, it's not a straight line. It's not a nice, clear road. You start to engage. You push the gas pedal, and we're going to go. But what you can expect coming up is this. You're gonna run into hard work. You're gonna run into struggles. You're gonna run into tests. You're gonna run into setbacks. You're gonna, there's gonna be tears, right? If we're driving the car, we can think about it like this. The hard work, that's the hills. There's gonna be a hill in front of you and you're gonna have to go over the hill. So the car's gonna have to work a little harder. The motor's gonna have to work a little harder, but the transmission's gotta stay engaged. You gotta stay working, all right? There'll be tests along the way. It'll be curvy. The road will be curvy. It might even slow you down a little bit. What do we do when we see curves coming up? They put a little sign that says, slow down. It gives you a suggested speed. See, we can't speed through all the obstacles God throws at us. We have to be willing to endure. The fully engaged Christian is willing to endure. You're fully engaged because you've grown, because you're mature enough to understand that I can't speed through this curve. I got to slow down. You got to focus. There's a hill, a windy road through Pennsylvania, which sometimes we take. It's uphill. It's got two lanes that go uphill, one lane that comes downhill. It's the wickedest curves back and forth. 
and then for whatever reason they determined the 18 wheelers should detour down this thing so you have 18 wheelers coming down one side you got um I don't know, left lane Louie driving slow on, on the left lane. You're trying to get up the right lane. You're trying to get up the hill. Your car is struggling. And the reality is, like, sometimes that's what our life feels like. Yeah. It's a lot of traffic coming down one side. Mm -hmm. There's cars here and there. Somebody's driving slow. The guy behind you wants to go fast, so he's riding up on you. The road itself is curvy. There's trees everywhere. There's a rock slide, uh, uh, a sign that says the rocks might slide down on you and a deer jumps out in front of you. How do you manage the situation when you're driving? How do you manage life when all those things are coming at you? When the, it's, it's uphill, right? It's a tough time right now and oh man, man, me and my wife, we're really struggling with this thing. And here come the kids, that's the hill. Here come the kids. 18 wheeler down the hill on the other side, full speed. Here go your boss throwing a pile of stuff on you that you gotta work on right in front of you. you got that letter, you got a triple homicide case you gotta work on now. Right, that's sitting in front of you. There's the person driving slow in the left lane. But at the same time, the bill collector's asking for money, so he's right behind you driving home from the horn. Right? What do we do in that situation? See, we gotta focus in. Everybody, know, we do this naturally when you're driving, or if you're good at driving, right? We slow down. And we focus. You pay attention to the lines. You make sure you stay in your lane. If I stay in my lane, that truck wouldn't hit me. You got to stay in your lane. You don't get outside the lines. You don't get outside the lines. You slow down. You take a second. You don't try to speed through it. You come to it. You read. You pray. You spend your time and you try to work through the situation. See, now that we're going forward because we're fully engaged, it's not that the road's going to be straight. You're going to deal with all these things. Are there going to be tears? Oh, yeah. It's emotional. I see. I would one of my friends on high school. As soon as we hit the highway, four cars went by. Broke down in tears. I'm scared. Right? We've been in situations that are hard. We've been, it's okay to cry. Like, it's scary. I'm a grown man. Sometimes I don't even know what to do. Sometimes I, I cry. Last year, around this time, I had a little neck issue. Called my wife on the phone crying. That's how she knew it was serious. She's like, are you crying? She said, are you crying? <laughs> I was like, yes, but I don't even care how you said that right there. <laughs> She's like, I gotta go. <laughs> All right. Now, those are the hardships. Those are the things that are going to occur on the road that happened in front of us. But also, if you look at the other side there, see, on the other side of the hardships, on the other side of the, yes. of, of the hill that you just climbed up, see, once I got to the top of the hill, this windy road in Pennsylvania, I get to the top of the hill, then I get to come down the other side of the hill. And the road is a little easier, and I don't have to worry about the semis coming down the hill because now they're coming up the hill. So they're slow. They slowed down. I can just kind of cruise, and the scenery is nice, right? So I'm yeah. looking up the side of a mountain, I just see trees. So on the other side, there's joy. Yes. Side. There's yeah. peace. Yeah. There's growth because you, you got better from what you just went through. Yeah. There's strength. There's perseverance. So what you can expect coming up in your life when you're a fully engaged Christian is that you can expect hardships, but you can also expect the joy, the peace, the perseverance, the grace that comes from God. Amen. 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 On the other side, right? Okay. Says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you <clears throat> in judgment you shall condemn, right? That's Isaiah 54, 17. You hear it all the time, and it's been preached yeah. ad nauseum about the fact that no weapon formed shall prosper, but there's always a weapon. Yes. It never says that it won't be formed. So when you think about driving forward, being fully engaged, your transmission going, your motor running, just know there's going to be an obstacle. You got to prepare for it. Are you prepared for it? <clears throat> Sorry, did I go too fast there? No. Also, come up in your life. I'm going to want to breeze past this kind of quickly. It's not. <clears throat> So all those things allow us to be that MVP. We talked about MVP in our seventh year, right? That was our, our going forward mantra for, not our mantra. It's our year seven mantra, not our 2024 mantra. Two, sorry, 2023 mantra. Um, but talking about being MVPs, mature, maturity, victory, prosperity. That's the thing that you're going to experience on the other side, right? We will be MVPs in your life. Now. Agape Church. What's coming up at Agape Church? Right? It's a lot of the same. 
There's going to be hard work. There's going to be people coming and going. See, as the church becomes fully engaged, now we just talked about it individually. You're picturing your own life and all the things that occur within your house. But now let's picture this from the church standpoint. All right. Being fully engaged as a church. Once we lock in as a church and all the gears tick, 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 line together and we're driving forward, the church itself is going to run into hard work. There's going to be people coming and there's going to be people going. That sounds bad, right? Like, what do you mean we're going to lose people? We will lose people along the way. That's that's the natural it's a natural thing that occurs in a church. Oftentimes we think when people go that that means there's something wrong with the church. People can leave for a myriad of reasons. You'll lose people who you love dearly, who love the church dearly, and God just called them somewhere else. You lose people because maybe they're hurt and they're upset. You'll lose people because of the weight of expectations. The church, we're all locked in and we're going this, this way, and the church is moving at a certain speed. Sometimes that's overwhelming for people. You'll lose people from that. You'll lose people because somebody said something mean that they shouldn't have said. They acted in an ungodly fashion and it, it hurt somebody and they left. That happens also in the church. To pretend like it doesn't would be to ignore a problem. So people will come and people will go. You have to deal with that as a church. Does that mean that we stop moving forward? Does it mean we disengage as a church? It shouldn't. See, we should be engaged, fully engaged. You'll have setbacks, right? We've, I've, my wife and I have been here six years. I have seen congregates come and go. I've seen leadership come and go. I have seen events that we try to do not go the way that we wanted. I've seen things have to be canceled that we had plans for. You'll have setbacks, right? You'll have an occasional flat tire. You're driving, and kaboom, flat tire. We had COVID. Setback. Right? So it comes along, but the ability to endure comes with the strength of God and the understanding of his word and the willing to trust in his plan. Right? So now I'm going to speak specifically about Agape Church, right? So how do we get fully engaged here? This is where we're talking about service. We're talking about prayer. We're talking about engagement. We're talking about getting all in with Agape Church your church because it's beneficial to your life. We went all the way back to our opening slide. Jada, can you help me? Can you go to Acts 47, 2, 47. Thank you. <clears throat> it says, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people, each day the Lord added to their fellowship <clears throat> those who were being saved. See, when we get fully engaged, when we become the church that comes together and we do the things together, We'll see the addition of stuff. But it has to be fully engaged. So we're going to have, we're going to have, like, the service opportunities. We're going to have the things that need to be going on. We're going to have events that are going to occur. We're going to have uh, outreach programs. We're going to have ministry, uh, small group, growth group ministries. We're going to have, we're going to have, we're going to have. And there's going to be opportunities for people to serve and do and get fully engaged. And the moment that we get fully engaged, we'll start moving forward. And when you move forward... See, God will add people to our lives. Because what will happen is we'll change our lives. Yeah. We'll change the lives of people who walk through the door. Yeah. And see, when people get saved, they'll start adding to what we have. And the more people we have, we can go further and further. So one of the things that we were talking about was, see, we have coming up, we have the come up. Talk about being on the come up. Agape Church is on the come up. I don't know if you guys know that term, but I feel like you should, right? That means we're getting ready to have something big happen within our church. So we have our seven ups. You had to show up, grow up, give up, live up, link up, speak up, sign up, because we're getting ready for the come up. And the come up requires coming up. It means you got to get engaged. We have to fully engage. <clears throat> we're going to have... You guys have already seen, well, I don't know. I think you've seen because you're in here and we're here every day. Right? We've seen the changes starting to happen in our church. I know we're in our building. We're in this building, I mean, but we're thinking about a building. We have to start to visualize what a God Bay church is going to look like. It's always, um, <clears throat> I 
Sometimes visualization as a Christian sounds crazy to other people. Let's go that route. It might sound a little crazy, because right now I'm in a room at an activity center, and I'm looking at roughly 30 people, and we're here, and we're Agape Church, and in my opinion, we're killing it today, later, let's go, right? All right, but let's think about visualizing beyond that. What do we see for Agape Church? What do each of you see for your church? We've been talking a lot about reflecting. What do you see for your church when you look out? See, I see hundreds of people. I see hundreds of people. I see that we have a welcome table out front that's been beautifully decorated, and I see 30 to 40 people every day coming in to get coffee and congregating out here, speaking to one another, loving on one another, sharing 25 to 30 minutes worth of fellowship before they come in here to hear the word. Matter of fact, they don't even come in here because we're not in this building in my dream, in my thoughts, in my yeah. process. We're in a bigger building Amen. with a bigger area with more stuff yeah. that allows us to have people to come and meet. Yeah. It sounds crazy to think that you would say, well, how can you see three, four hundred people coming into a building to hear the word of God? I see our pastor standing up there preaching the word of God and there are lives being changed in front of them. I see a whole sound team in the back, not just Jada and Drew, and they're doing a great job, but we got, we got too much stuff for them to be able to do it all. There's going to be a camera on the side. There's going to be a, a strobe, a spotlight that shines down so people can see the active growth, the glory of God. See, it comes when we start doing that thing to the glory of God. It's not about having stuff. It's not about having money. It's not about having possessions. It's about the ability to reach people. See, I just believe that God's going to do that for Agape Church. It sounds crazy to somebody who doesn't know God. You tell that to your friend, like, oh, okay, yeah, the Agape Church working at Activity Center is going to have a, a gigantic building with a, a basketball hoop in it. The kids can come play. Yes, yeah. it's going to have that. I see service teams. There's going to be a hospitality team. Yeah. There's going to be a watchman team. There's going to be a worship for him team. There's going to be an act crew that does set up and clean up. There's going to be a kids ministry yeah. team. And then we all going to have a kickball challenge, and I'm going to win that thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? I see us rolling in with crews, right? A whole crew. We have a summer kickball league. Yeah, yes, Show the hospitality team what's up. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Right? I don't know why it's got to be kickball. I just pick kickball. I can't hit a, I can't swing the bat. So. <laughs> Slow pitch softball. I was struggling. Sorry, and Nana's on my team, so watch out. <laughs> She's sneaky quick. The point being, it sounds crazy if you don't have the faith or you don't know God. See, it's not yes. crazy to anybody who knows what God can yeah, do. Amen. Right. It starts with us becoming fully engaged. We're going to have this month. It's a, I know it's always something. It's a lot of stuff. We got pastor appreciation, right? We just came off of a, a building fund campaign where we were getting money so we can procure that building that we're thinking about that we can see into the future is going to be here because God is working and promising, right? We're going to have, we're, we're introducing service teams today. We're going to have the option out there for you guys to go. There's going to be signups, right? People, a chance to get engaged. And Pastor talked about it a little bit last week where he said, he's like, these are the things that are going to exist. There's going to be a hospitality crew. There's going to be a watch a watchman crew. And if anybody who's on the leadership team already knows, because we started enacting it. You guys see uh, Team Matthews at the front there just <laughs> smiling, introducing everybody. Like, hey, how you doing? Hold the guy church crew, right? It's a good face. I even know him, and it still makes me happy to see him at the door, right? I kind of, I, 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 I low key asked him to do it, but I was still surprised and happy when I was like, man, that is just nice to see him. My God, it's just so happy. I'm glad I asked him to do that. I'm glad Pastor asked me to ask him to do that. I'm glad God asked Pastor to ask me to ask him to do that, right? So to the glory of God, we're going to have those things. Today, as you guys are leaving out, if you want a chance to get fully engaged, just stop out there. We got a QR code. It's easy, right? If you don't know how to use a QR code, don't worry. My wife will show you because I, I don't know how to do anything. No. Um, there's a chance to sign up for opportunities out there at our connection table, which is new, right? Yeah. Connection table is a spot where we're going to meet and, and, and greet people and meet them with their needs so they have the ability to do this. We've got to get engaged as a church. And not that Deaconess Renisha was not up here killing it singing today, but like, imagine a fleet. Imagine a fleet singing. Right? A rotation. You know, because you can't have uh, Elder Kyle up there singing because my voice, the way it sounds. <clears throat> no. <laughs> Deacon Dan, we're going to get over next. Pastor Mike. Pastor Mike. 
All right, but being fully engaged, so we got to start to see that lock in. What's coming up at Agape Church is the come up, but it's going to require us to come up, to come up, to get signed up, to grow up, to enact all of those seven ups, to be ready fully engaged. Can you hear some music, please? I'm definitely uh, rolling down here. <clears throat> So as we think about as we think about maturing and living a life fully engaged, getting that transmission into gear, driving forward, avoiding <clears throat> the obstacles, navigating through the hard times, dealing with the struggles, celebrating the joys, the ups, coming together in our downs. Right? Knowing that as we trust in God, it's going to be okay. We have to remember that everything is for the glory of God. Yes. Everything we do, we do because we love the Lord. As you sign up for a service team, you're doing it because you love God. Right? It's not a life sentence. It's not the only thing you'll ever have to do in the church. But you're saying, hey, I want to be a, I want to be a smiling face. I want, to, I want to set the papers out on the table. I can do that for you, God, as he presses on you. Right? But remember, it's for the glory of God. It's not about impressing the pastors. It's not about impressing the elders. It's not about impressing your friends. It's about being a representative for Christ. Yes. And as long as we fully engage and we do everything to the glory of God, he's going to bless this church. And as he blesses this church, he will bless this community. And as he blesses this community, he will change lives. People will become saved. They will know Jesus Christ. They will live in a better fashion. They'll be able to deal with the hurts and the hangups that come along. See, it's not that Christ comes in your life and just eliminates all your problems. He just is the solution to all your problems. Amen. It's all for the glory of God. So Agape family and friends, great news. There are three ways that you can give cheerfully in the house of God. We encourage you to partner with us to advance God's kingdom to go further and farther into many people's lives. The first way you can give is number one, give by phone through Cash App, dollar sign, love like him. Number two, give at www.lovelikehim.today. Click on the donate button and follow the prompts there. Lastly, number three, you can mail in your charitable givings to 345 Green Street, Havita Grace, Maryland, 21078. Agape Church would like to thank you for your charitable giving today, and we pray that the Lord will shower you with his choice blessings. Thank you for joining and participating in our Agape Church. We pray and believe with expectation that you received a word from God for your life today with revelation unto your transformation. If today's word inspired you in a special way, we would love to hear from you. You can connect and reach us by phone or email. Text need prayer. New member, one info, two, four, four, three, six, four, zero, seven, four, nine, one. You can also reach us via email, prayer, member, or info at lovelikehim.today. We look forward to connecting with you real soon.